And uh, thank you all for coming today. And um, we'll probably have more people coming in throughout the morning uh, because uh, we all know that traffic was is kind of bad today because it's raining and so people forget how to drive and the trains don't know how to run. Um, anyway, again, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to introduce our Senior Associate Dean of the Damore McKim School of Business, uh, Dr. Emery Trahan. Emery is also a professor of finance in the school, and I think he's been here maybe one year longer than I have. So we've been both been here a very long time, uh, and we've seen a lot of changes uh, to uh, the university, and fortunately, a lot of happy changes. So uh, please welcome uh, Emery Trahan. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, well, I, I'm fairly new in this job in the, the dean's office, and as Gloria said, I've been a professor of finance for, for many years, so my, I have to confess my um, knowledge of design is somewhat limited, but I, I did read um, Steve Jobs' uh, biography a few years ago and really found that the design aspect came to appreciate that a lot of Apple's success is really, uh, they're a design company, right? Steve Jobs and Johnny Eves and... Uh, it really was striking to me. I, I also, a, a few years ago, went to a, a one-day seminar put on by Ed Tufte at Yale University. He puts on a, a one-day show on presenting data and information, and, and it's really about a, a, design, a lot of design stuff. That If you haven't seen that day, I, I would recommend it. I, th I found it very interesting. But I, So I guess I, I know enough about design to be dangerous at this point, but that's... <laughs> about it. But um, I also, a lot of the, the reading I've been doing suggests that design is really uh, getting to be a, a big thing in business schools, right? It's really a, a, an up-and-coming topic uh, in schools of business. And I, I'm glad to see uh, the Damore McKim sort of on, on the forefront of uh, doing things in the design area. So I'd like to, uh, to welcome you to uh, the conference today, the Institute for Global Innovation Management and Intellectual Property Innovation Connection Conference, kind of a, a long name, but we, we're integrating a lot of things into this conference, which I, I think is exciting. Um, the, the Institute for Global Innovation Management, IGM, is an interdisciplinary research institute focused on helping to improve innovation efforts worldwide. Um, and th this is actually the second IGM-sponsored conference here at Northeastern. Um, and then with this conference, we're formally incorporating the Intellectual Property Innovation Connection Conference that's been run the past three years at the DeMore McKim N Law School by our Professor Susan Montgomery, who's a joint appointment here with DeMore McKim and the, the law school. Um, and then finally this year, it's, it's truly been an interdisciplinary effort as we've also collaborated with several colleagues from the College of Arts Media and uh, design to develop the conference this year. So I think uh, you know we're, we're very much into uh, interdisciplinary here at Northeastern, and th this conference is a great example, I think, of uh, organizing something along those lines. It, it looks to be a very exciting conference, and looking at the program and the uh, the participants, again, it, it's it's very cross disciplinary. Looking at some of the the key organizers from the Demore McKim School, uh, professors Gloria Barzak and. Tucker Marion, some of our, our leading uh, scholars doing innovation work in the in the School of Business, along with the, the School of Business and the School of Law, Susan Montgomery, um, one of our, our leaders in intellectual in the intellectual property area, and then uh, from the College of Arts, Media, and Design, Nathan Feld is here, Mark Sivak, and and Ann McDonald. Um, all uh, engaged in emerging design practices. So I think it, it's a nice, uh, very uh, cross-disciplinary mix of, uh, of faculty from, the, uh, from Northeastern. The, the participants also seem to be a, a very diverse group, right? We have students here today, we have uh, academics, and we have um, uh, industry practitioners and attorneys from a wide variety of backgrounds. So I, I think it's it's a nice mix of uh, participants here as well. We have a, a prominent keymo keynote speaker, right? Lee Moreau, a principal at Continuum, one of the leading design companies in the world, is here as the speaker. Um, and the, the focus of the conference is design, impact, and challenge. Uh, we have four panels laid out for the day, one on emerging design practices, one on applying design to new industries, one on is design lost in the process, 
And then finally this afternoon, um, one on intellectual property thinkers look at design. And I think that looks like an interesting format where, where Susan has brought in uh, several uh, attorneys, uh, corporate attorneys working in this area that to pull together some of the ideas from the prior three panels and address uh, some of the intellectual property issues that, uh, that come up. Um, and then finally, I think the, the Ann Benware, who works with me in the dean's office, I know does an excellent job uh, planning and managing these events. So I think you'll find uh, <laughs> the food will be excellent and the, uh, the facilities and so on. Um, so again, welcome. I, I think you have a very uh, exciting program laid out for today. And I hope you'll find it to be an invigorating and useful day. But thank you for coming. Thank you, Emery. So now I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend and, and co-researcher, and we do a lot of things together, um, Tucker Marion. So Tucker is an associate professor in our entrepreneurship and innovation group. And uh, Tucker has a lot of similar interests to I, which is why we do a lot of work together. We're both uh, interested in product development, the product development process, uh, and design, and digital tools for product development. And so I'd like to introduce Tucker Marion. Oh, uh, thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Emery. And uh, thank you all for coming. For uh, I think this is going to be a stimulating and, and fun day for everyone. Uh, I wanted to say a few words about design. Uh, about a year ago, we've been working on this topic for about a year uh, for, to have this conference. And we, as Henry mentioned, we wanted to be very interdisciplinary and cut across a number of different boundaries. Design is, in many ways, a, a buzzword now, and rightfully so. If you look at the transformation of, of Apple, let's say, over the last 15 years, and this goes well beyond form and function or thinking about the user, but it goes into business model innovation, services. Uh, design has a very large impact on what we do from large startup companies to the largest multinational organizations. And one of the things that we wanted to try to do was to address the breadth and scope of design uh, and how it has transformed over the last 30 years, uh, going from you know, deeply understanding the user and form and function to now uh, being applied to social innovation and other models uh, that are helping people globally. So, uh, as Emery mentioned, we have four panels today. The first is, is really to understand and think about emerging design practices, what's new, what's changing, uh, from big data to, to other areas, visualization. Uh, the panel that I'll be leading the panel discussion on is how design is being applied to different types of industries that normally, traditionally, wouldn't think about design. Uh, biomedical devices, uh, big pharma. How are they using design thinking and strategies and innovation to enhance their process and their business models? Uh, and then, of course, as, as Gloria mentioned, we do a lot of research in, in digital design tools and rapid prototyping and social networking. Uh, how is things like rapid prototyping uh, being woven into the design process? And how is that changing? How is uh, open innovation and our ability to easily innovate and collaborate and share and change things. How does design apply to that sort of very dynamic world? And then lastly, uh, look at the challenges that companies face with intellectual property and how does that impact how companies approach design? How do they defend it? Uh, I, I, we've all seen over the last several years the, the battle between Samsung and Apple. How does that really impact design strategy as a firm goes forward? and commercializes their innovations. So I think that we'll have uh, some very good discussions today. Typically, uh, the panels will run. There'll be presentations. And then we'll open it up in a more informal discussion format and uh, encourage a lot of audience participation. Uh, just some logistics. Bathrooms are over there in the corner. Uh, we'll be serving lunch at 12.30. At uh, 12.30, uh, we'll also have a keynote. We're very excited to have Lee Moreau from Continuum talk about their transformation over the last 25 years. It is really a great story. Uh, and then our final panel uh, will end around 5.30 or so, and we'll have a reception where we can talk a little more informally. So I'm looking forward to getting started. So let me, uh, I'm very uh, excited to introduce our first panel. The moderator is Professor Nathan Feld. Uh, from the uh, College of Arts, Media, and Design, and I'll leave it to you to introduce your panel. Welcome. 
So um, I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I think it's fantastic that we have the mix of people that we have in the room, and, and that Northeastern's doing what Northeastern does best, bring all this together. Uh, so, uh, and the other thing I'm happy about is the makeup of the particular panel we're uh, about to hold, hold in terms of the mix of practices and practitioners uh, who were able to make it here, and I thank you again uh, very much for being able to do that. Um, I think what I need to do is advance. Anyway, so uh, as has been mentioned, the panel this morning is discussing emerging design practices. Uh, and what I thought I would do is frame design as a practice and do so to indicate as much of the variety and the depth of design practice. So I'm calling this a, his a brief history of design uh, from zero to infinity. Uh, I'll let you read these. I have violated all the rules of visual communication by putting too many words on, on view graphs. Ed Tufte would be appalled. Uh, I should have printed this, distributed it to you, and had one image. Um, but we're going to violate those rules, as designers often do, to discover what is possible beyond what's probable. So uh, design is what you do when you don't know what to do. As that, uh, it's, it's a very human function to do that. When you think about the options of, uh, of fight or flight, Design offers this moderate case of the in-between, the middle course, the middle way. Uh, but in some sense, it's prototyping and getting ready to replicate. So this fragment really kind of represents this first instance, at least, and because a lot of what we're going to talk about is Eurocentric in terms of design and its role in the modern world today. Uh, you can see the basis for this is established uh, with this lovely fragment, which just recently discovered. Design is intentional human change that creates new choices. Businesses love new choices. They want to test new markets. They want to open up uh, the world to new choices. People need choice. They need diversity. There's an interesting paradox in this one image because if you look at the indigenous ingenuity that produced the variety of costume on the left, that's within an ethnic group, not an ethnic group. And this is this other ethnic group of the modern world where choice is somewhat bounded, somewhat constrained in interesting ways. There's a little par paradox there to think about. Apple's been referenced a couple of times this morning uh, and having, including my panel, having uh, inter interactions with Apple over time during its history as kind of an interesting, sort of my, my only chart today, looks at, at uh, an exponential growth. And so if you read that first, uh, sentence about Apple. I think that's defendable, at least up to this point, or at least last summer, or the summer before. Uh, we are we're actually a little ahead of the curve when we get to 2014. We're closer to 2.9. I think Paul Pangaro probably knows the exact actually number. But there's some key numbers in here, and there's a key move in here. When Paul Rand left the world of advertising to open up his own studio in Connecticut, the solo hero designer kind of established a beachhead in America and became eventually Steve Jobs' go-to guy for visual design. It'll come up again. Uh, Paul Rand will come up again. I was going to call this from Paul Rand to Rand Paul to sort of frame everything for you politically. But, uh, but you can see here where in, in 1984, between, in 10 years between 1984 and 1994, the rapid growth of the distribution of the tools for doing graphic design, and I point out graphic design in particular because it's so fungible, and it, and it produced not only news about what it was doing uh, while it was doing it, but it also produced all these uh, devotees of design who could read about design while they were using this new gear. I also wanted to establish the global scope of design. Uh, in, in these two kitchens, this one by Oraito, and this one is in, in a village in Mali, so I call it from Mali to Milan, uh, sort of frame what a kitchen can be in this world. And designers, since designers don't look at things, they look between things, it's really helpful for designers to see these you know, flags on the pitch. Uh, this is what we're looking at. Somewhere in here, there's a kitchen. Somewhere in here, your kitchen exists. Uh, so that's to frame. And then as we talk about cyber, and virtual, it's always good to remember, again, where the, the flags on the pitch say, well, there are two kinds of surfing in the world, and you're somewhere in between those most of the time, or some combination of those, this visceral, palpable presence that seems to persist you know, as we flee from absence, as Olga Ast would say, with our bodies. So that's, again, to frame it. 
So again, I will quickly say, and then you'll hear a lot more from each of these presenters, um, a couple of comments about them. One, when I thought of Jenna Fizell, I thought of well, designers make things, but designers make things and make things happen. That's a different thing from making things. Uh, Tucker referred to form and function and the objects. In the 19th century, it was a choice between utility and beauty. You know, you, you got the utility and then you slap some beauty on it and you had a stove. Uh, Tinsley uh, is, is a designer of immersive experience, and you'll hear a lot more about that from him. But in some sense, there's a goal to his immersive experience in the work, say museums or instruction, things like that, is to improve the quality of the question, not the answer. So it's not designing the encyclopedia, but designing a medium within which someone can create the encyclopedia they carry within them. And then Paul Pangaro, who I've known maybe the longest in the room, yeah, 1978 or nine, um, I was born the year cybernetics was invented by Norbert Wiener. So it's been around while I've been around. I haven't done much with it uh, until I ran into Paul in 1979 and uh, learned about it. And I've been learning about it ever since. And what we came to it at some point along the way was that the medium for design is conversation, not an Apple laptop. Conversation. So that'll be important to what we talk about today. I thought I should also establish some definitions for design. Uh, some of some, uh, the, uh, the eminent professor, Mihai Nadine, semiotics professor who taught at RISD, is now at uh, University of Texas, Dallas. Design is what designers do, full stop. End of story, let's go to work. Uh, Todd Oldham, uh, Richard Werman, who's on our faculty in our information design program here and uh, invented the TED conference. Uh, had Todd Holdem at, at a conference recently, he said, if you want to understand design, try to make a shirt. Uh, think about that one. Uh, it's in the sleeve in here where it's get interesting, right? <laughs> and then, of course, I have, I'll quote myself, uh, you know, but I, this, I love being able to say this. It's because it, the guts of all this is not what you see in the marketplace as those things that have been designed. It's that really ugly, messy process of getting it to that point and making a lot of mistakes, some of which you bury, you know, as they say, architects can never bury their mistakes, you know, but doctors can. So the des designers have to live amongst them. Uh, and then this wonderful definition from Fuller, whose name will come up again and again. Now, if you want to know a lot more about design design process, just Google Doubly Design Office. Hugh Doubly is on our faculty here as well, is, and, and his office is in San Francisco. You will find a wealth of how do you design uh, uh, processes beautifully illustrated. And then if you want to know what good design is in the next millennium, we go to the uh, literature. Italo Calvino, the, the author of books you may, The Baron and the Trees and things like that you may have read before. He wrote these six, and I say five or six memos for designers in the next millennium. He was writing for writers. These were speeches meant to be given as uh, Sanders lectures at Harvard. He unfortunately died before he could deliver them, and he actually died before he could finish the book but we knew the outline of the book and we know some of it. So if you can read about the first five, which were written, the, uh, it's, the book is called Six Memos and it has five memos in it and the fifth one and the sixth one is consistency. That's kind of ironic. Uh, and then we know from Guy Davenport that his wife knew there were gonna be eight, uh, eight actually eight sections, uh, one of which was gonna be on beginning and ending, a very important thing and for designers and artists and everyone to use, you know, art they say takes one person to make stuff and another person to tell them when to stop. Um, so these are principles, if you read into them, uh, that are you can think of as criteria for excellent design in the millennium. Lightness, quickness, exactitude. Multiplicity is interesting in terms of how you achieve that in today's world. Then I thought we should look back and see sort of the, the trajectory of the vector from back to uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, da Vinci, who is quoted as this art science polymath. Uh, the citizenship, the advocacy, social engagement of Benjamin Franklin, the key role he played in inventing this country, uh, producing the design functional specification document called the Constitution. Uh, and then uh, Thomas Jefferson saying, here's the medium, it's sort of North America, kind of in the midsection where it's temperate. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, start with the universe, serve everyone, be naive, again, is a very important point. And then Charles and Ray Ames, a husband-wife team, this power of two. A lot of design firms are two, twosomes, duets, couplets, people talking to each other, and that thus conversation. Conversation is the medium in which they work, and all of us who design have been in partnerships at one time or another working with people conversationally. Um, 
Dieter Rams, I mentioned him in the last IP conference, is someone who uh, invented all those forms that Steve Jobs loved and uh, put into his products. Uh, if you go buy a 1952 bronze razor or something like that, I think I actually have one from 1974. Uh, they'll look reminiscent of some things you're familiar with today. Tibor Kalman, I, I point out, is the designer's auteur of artifacts. He, he had kind of a, a Charles Ames practice, Charles and Ray Ames practice of, of looking at a lot of different things, but he tended to be more focused on artifacts. But he had an, an incredible commission from Benetton to build their world brand and built a magazine called Colors in which he dug into the toughest subjects on earth and made that a part of the brand for Benetton. You're going to buy a sweater, you got to think about AIDS. You got to buy a sweater, you got to think about, you know, the position women have in the world today, all over the world. Um, so he was a real uh, social advocate in a form, uh, but insinuated into the kinds of things he did hand in hand with corporations. And the other thing I say about Dieter Rams is someone who's, a, who's synonymous with a corporation's identity, brand, and products, and having a, that, that role. Or Ito, I, I put in as the example, um, he's actually the designer of the kitchen, uh, the, the Milano kitchen. And his subversive strategy of coming to the fore as a designer by hijacking brands. And so we can talk about that in IP this afternoon. The big move today, and I think is being more and more recognized by this inter interdisciplinarity, uh, is, is uh, this model of collective and interdisciplinary design practice. And I, looked, I studied, and I, I was telling Susan, I learned, I learned some interesting things as I looked at putting this together. Uh, and again, uh, you see you see there's kind of a pattern here. There's a cycle. It's almost like a 10-year cycle, at least the ones I picked through my lens, right, and what I'm familiar with. But there's a, there's, Muriel Cooper is in a very pivotal position here with, with a, a thread that runs through the development of these practices, uh, collective practices. You look at, uh, so she came to MIT in 1952, and from that sprang many, many, many things, um, uh, going up to her uh, sort of early death, uh, just after the TED Five conference, where she sort of unleashed on the world all the things they were doing with with media uh, and f and dynamic media and large scale data representation, data visualization, which uh, people are now applying. So she really is is seminal person in this whole practice, this collective practice idea, and, and the principles that she worked with of keeping uh, open ended questions in front of you all the time. Cambridge Seven. Uh, again, bringing seven practitioners beyond the scope of architecture. So 52, 62, 72, Richard Werman started as the architect, moved into information architecture, coined that phrase, became the idea impresario through TED, um, and is now at Northeastern, as we mentioned. Pentagram, uh, whom you might know from today's uh, global reach of their practice, I was actually preceded by Cambridge Seven, and, and Cambridge Seven was a bit of a model for them. The Shemayev, uh, Ivan Shemayev, Serge Shemayev, and Peter Shemayev uh, in, in the Cambridge Seven group. And then today we have Lee Moreau, and I won't say anything about, about the design continuum because we have the man here today. But this idea of recombinant talent in the global practice, I think, is that something will come through in what he's talking about. Clement Mock is an interesting person as a graphic designer. He worked along Steve Jobs on the identity of Apple, and then he, being a sharp guy, migrated out of that role, started his own business, anticipated things for the net with uh, before Mosaic, and well, when Mosaic was around as a browser, net objects, sold that to IBM for about 20 million, and then ended up selling his practice to Sapient. So he represents an individual graphic designer who turned his practice into a consultancy that was valuable to Sapient at about the time when they required his practice. Bruce Mao, uh, who is well known for his work with Zone Publishing, uh, really came out as a graphic designer, but now really operates um, thinking big thoughts about big projects all over the world. Some of them have to do with talking to advisory agencies and councils about, say, the formation of a nation in some of these uh, places in the world where cessation, uh, secession is, is, is a subject. And then IDO, which you're familiar with from the D school, and, uh, and taking it from there, where I think design thinking got a big push coming out of that. I'm going to give you nine theoretical hypothetical design practices that I'm familiar with, some of which I'm familiar with because I invented them. Um, so, uh, managing as designing is something I encountered in sort of uh, 90, 90, say 1997 at uh, Case Western. Um, Dick Boland, Fred Colopy, and Richard Buchanan, who at that time was at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Richard Buchanan was a philosopher from University of Chicago who was head of the design school at Carnegie Mellon. Talk about interdisciplinary. Um, 
they really took on this uh, and brought together about 50 academics on looking at managing as designing. And it seemed uh, like it was kind of a, an idea in, in, of the moment, uh, and I think we're seeing threads of that showing up in a lot of other places. But I think design thinking may be one of the ways that's manifesting itself in the world today. But it's very good to go back to that conference and look at that material. A tremendous archive material. The uh, keynote designer at that was uh, Frank Geary, the architect. So he revealed his, his practice to them in a very, very tangible, uh, very palpable way, uh, participatory way. Transitional design, uh, Terry Irwin, Cameron Tonkin-Wise, basically um, is proposing that there is a practice that has to do with moving to sustainability globally. And that this is this kind of a transition, you know, a way to think about design to transition to that kind of world. Paul Pangaro forwarded to me uh, something he found, and I don't know how you found this thing, but it was uh, a U.S. Army Operations Field Manual, uh, which has in its introduction one of the best descriptions of the power and efficacy of design that I've probably ever read. That's an U.S. Army manual. A field manual, that means it's operational. So what they're t saying is designing, uh, as managing as designing is sort of fighting as designing uh, as a kind of a doctrine. Very interesting document. Eventual design for an emergent world is a, is a framework I put together about 10 years ago uh, based on a memo that Hugh Doubly wrote to uh, the management school at Yale, a professor there. And I'll show you a brief picture of some of the thinking behind that. Sea turtle design came out of a uh, consulting gig with, uh, uh, for Samsung, uh, the sum of which was hurry slowly. Uh, so the problem was how to manage a, uh, a thousand designers who are distributed all over the world. Uh, and so we had a we had a shot at that, and uh, we can talk more about each of these at, at length. The uh, as I say, this next one is about this imaginary school, uh, design school focusing, and it's the school of behavioral arts. Uh, all the progress in the behavioral sciences are fueling a lot of what we can do in the world today, and no one's really pulled together this school of behavioral arts where we look at all those things that have to do with belief and behavior and form. Uh, now, behavioral art you could call music. Tony's here. We could say that's a behavioral art. It has all to do with performance. And you'll see behavior and performance are very closely related. I'll point to these sociocracy, post-governance coming out of the uh, Netherlands, uh, being used by, successfully by firms that are uh, emergent firms. They're, they're highly creative. They're uh, a new generation of software uh, development, so forth. And it's based on, on contingent circles. Uh, there's a lot, uh, not a lot written about it, but it's a very fascinating thing. And people are practicing it. And, uh, some interest. And then I'll go back to Fuller, whose comprehensive anticipatory design science really s draws the kind of biggest scope about all the pieces that are required to practice design uh, ethically in the world today. Um, ingenuity in the design connectome. Uh, this is what I observe as I look across the field and see the, uh, the small efforts of, of, of disparate firms and collectives around the world taking on design problems. A lot of them opening up storefronts and so forth in, dis in, in disturbed areas dis or uh, difficult areas, uh, areas experiencing economic difficulty. And they're nomadic, uh, they move around, it's kind of the uh, woofing, you know, the, the organic farming thing where kids are going around the world and getting their food by working on organic farms. You have these design activities going on as well. Interdisciplinary, open source, their, their IP is, you know, We'll move on. That's an idea. Ideas are free. Let's keep moving. Uh, but that's just to point to that as design as intelligent response to uncertainty. And if you go back to what I first said at the beginning, uh, the uh, design is what you do when you don't know what to do. This, when you're faced with uncertainty, it's an intelligent way to respond to that rather than run away or fight it. Um, now, this I won't go through much except to just show you that if you extend Hugh's memo, uh, this chart he made for old and new, uh, that transition that we went through and practically almost through, you do arrive at what we at that time called eventual design, which is this uh, business of keeping track of the time scale within which you're working. But you can see these transmission, uh, these transformations that have happened uh, in, in the practice today, conversation being the medium. And it's not about simplicity anymore, it's achieving sophistication because simplicity is a way of dumbing things down in one definition of it. But there's a lot to be said about all that. I also wanted to talk about some schools to watch. I think we should always keep an eye on the Bauhaus. So many things are done there that were never brought to fruition. A lot of the best ideas never get implemented. Black Mountain College, there'll be a conference in the fall. Uh, 
Northeastern's going to be involved with the ICA in a um, colloquium and exhibition around Black Mountain College, which due to uh, World War II at the time, emigres and so forth, put this amazing collection of really interesting people, Gregory Bateson, Merce Cunningham, John Cage, uh, the Albers, uh, all in one place in a very obscure place in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, the uh, Institute of Design in Pune, India, which focuses on process, almost like, uh, almost like a, a, a Hindu uh, ethos. Uh, never mind what the end, what's coming out the end. If you get the process right, you'll get the right thing out the end. Uh, Ucal in Lima, Peru, where there's a professor, Oscar Moss, is questioning the process. Uh, D School you're familiar with, Carnegie Mellon, this transition design is worth keeping an eye on. And then in Europe, I think Alto University, this recombinant university, Idea, uh, BKF in Budapest, uh, this art, the classic art science mix. Central St. Martin's, be where the cosmopolitan buzz around design is really happening. It's a high fever pitch there in London. There's, it's you know, extremely exciting for those who live in Boston. It would be kind of unnerving. Um, and then Northeastern University, that's where we are today. We're proposing that might be the next nexus. So um, the challenge. Here are two ways of stating that challenge. One is Victor Papinek, who was... Uh, discouraged by many uh, in his efforts early, early on uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, to reshape design thinking within the US kind of commercial mass market industrial complex. Uh, but nevertheless, the things he's saying today still ring true. And he did invest a lot in understanding uh, what could be done about Buckminster Fuller's challenge. So with that, I thank you. I hope I didn't, it wasn't too much of a drink out of a fire hose as I was telling my students this morning. But uh, I wanted to make sure we framed it broadly and deeply and diversely so we understand the variety that we're about to hear. So Jenna Fizell will uh, lead off with us and uh, take us through a bit of an inside tour of her practice, how she thinks and works in a particular way in today's moment. Thank you, Jenna. All right, great. Hi, um, I'm Jenna, and I would like to talk to you today about um, a very simple aspect of design that I think is core to pretty much everything designers do, and you learn probably on the second day of uh, design school, or in my case, architecture school, um, and how that relates to my work at many different scales, um, from the professional down to the personal. Um, the big reveal is that is that design should always express the tools and materials that are used to create it. Um, and I believe this very deeply. And as a person who's both a programmer and a designer, that means that um, whatever work I do needs to express um, not just the environment or the physical reality of the designed object, but also uh, the code that went into making it. I spend most of my day you know, typing strings of characters into a keyboard. Um, and to not show that in the final result um, would, would hurt my soul. <laughs> but at the same time, the things that I make always exist in the physical world. Sometimes they are partially digital, but um, they're always something that can be inhabited by a person. So I want to start at sort of a very large scale, uh, which is designing an environment. So this is a lobby museum uh, created for Biogen IDEC by a small design firm. Um, and for this project, I spent a lot of time visualizing the space before uh, it was actually produced because we had the opportunity to actually um, do not just the digital uh, design but also the physical design. So this is um, our rendering at the end of concept design and then this is the space as built. Um, and the ability to really precisely model things before um, creating them lets you uh, have some surprising results. So um, if you can see the, uh, the, the circles that are present throughout the space are also present inside the digital space that you interact with. So on each of the screens, which are unfortunately pretty blown out, those, um, those circles continue. Um, of course, this is a big physical project, which means that there are a lot of other people involved in producing it. Um, we're just a, a small company. Um, but because we were able to specify uh, all of these forms with such a precise uh, level of detail digitally, um, they were able to be made sort of exactly as imagined. Um, and this, this was also very fortuitous. We ended up uh, working on a small enough scale that, and having things work out well enough that nothing went terribly wrong. 
Um, but you can see that this here is sort of the, the digital realm, a, a schematic representation of uh, the graphics, the overall graphic themes within the space. And then this is those, those themes inside the model of the physical space. Um, so, sort of getting down to a slightly smaller scale, uh, that was, as uh, the project I just showed was mostly created through tradi traditional manufacturing methods. Um, and on the scale of a room, that's great, you can get high precision and um, high compliance with your digital model. But what happens when you're trying to make something a little bit more intimate? Um, and that's when you might want to start using digital fabrication techniques. Um, at this point, they're cheap enough and they're even more closely connected to the code um, than other forms. So this is a project for um, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, um, not too far from here. Uh, it's a donor wall. Um, these fish uh, represent different donations by people to the Cancer Institute. Um, they're zebrafish, uh, and Dana-Farber is mildly famous for inventing a transparent zebrafish to more quickly let scientists um, look at different disease models. So these are sort of a different form of transparent zebrafish. Um, and, uh, are we playing? Great. Uh, and there are a series of 478 uh, individually printed fish um, that uh, it have engraved on them the name of each donor. And anyone can walk up to this wall and touch a fish and then see the message that was left by that person on digital screens, um, which you can see a person doing just there. But of course, that's the, uh, that's the nice pretty side that we show the client. Uh, under the hood, what it, this is is a, is a 3D model um, that and a piece of code that generates uh, the fish geometry. So every time someone pledges for a new fish, um, I open up my little script and hit run, and uh, then a new fish is created. Uh, it looks like this, and we send it off to a 3D printed printing service, um, and we eventually get a little fish back, and someone goes and installs it on the wall. So in the end, it's actually a very hand manual process, but I hope that it expresses um, the the complexity of the, of the tools that went into creating it. Um, I've also thought about how digital tooling um, changes the idea of manufacturing. So this kind of goes back to um, the, the shirt comment earlier. Uh, this is a project I did with a former uh, side project, uh, side company that I had uh, with a friend. Um, and this was about, all about um, rethinking how to manufacture clothing um, in light of digital fabrication tools. So this is maybe not super well known by, by many people, but fabric now can be directly printed on sort of through an enormous inkjet printer, um, which means that you can sort of make parametric patterns. And if you have a way of laying them out, um, you can just literally print onto fabric uh, a traditional pattern and have that cut and sewn. So we uh, made this website that you can um, upload your own photos to and input your body's dimensions and then see in real time um, a simulation of your garment um, and then order it and pr have it produced. So these are a few examples. Um, this is from the Sagrada Familia. This is one of my uh, former partner's friend's photography. Um, so this is more on the scale of both a person but also a manufacturing process. Um, so that's not, that's not the only way that digital design impacts my life. I also use it um, in my day-to-day -day, uh, and sort of on a more personal human scale. Um, so I like to make my own um, bags and purses. I, my method is pretty much always the same. I dump out all the things I want to put in my purse, measure them, and then build a purse around those shapes. So these are some of... A few examples of bags that I've made. Um, and then this is an example of uh, a model. So you sort of have this sort of tortured form that's then laid down into uh, these uh, triangles. Build, always, always build a model. So I build a paper model, and then eventually um, the actual thing out of leather. Um, I like to feather my home as well. So this is an example of uh, a lamp that I made. Um, and the exciting part to me about that project is that I actually wrote code to create all of the um, 
connections between the pieces, uh, which is always the most challenging part in uh, laser cut projects like that one because you sort of imagine it and think, oh, that will definitely go together, but you forget that there's thickness and collisions. And so coming up with a system to, to automatically generate those things is uh, rewarding. Um, and this is a, called Imaginary Lands. Uh, I scan some maps from books that I liked as a child and turn them into vectors. And then I have a pen plotter, and I just plotted them all and put them on a wall. Um, and then finally, my most recent example is a desk that I built this past weekend. Um, <laughs> It was. It took more than a weekend to actually cut all of the pieces, um, but it's finally together. Um, and I managed to remember to build into in, into it a, a cord uh, system, which I'm actually most happy about of all the things. Uh, and this was a very fun process. I like to you know enjoy my designing. Uh, I uh, worked on it with a friend um, in uh, at Haystack School of Mountain Crafts in Maine. Um, where I sometimes volunteer over the summer, and this is an example of the workspace that we were that we worked in. Um, in the back there, that's a giant CNC machine um, that was what actually cut the desk. So this is the these are the cut files. So that's the entire desk laid out flat, um, and then this is my simulation because of course I always simulate everything. I knew what I wanted to put on top of it, needed everything to fit, um, but not everything can be simulated. Sometimes you need people to help you screw in screws. <laughs> um, and then sometimes you need to prop things up when they need to be glued. So, thanks. I hope that gave you a little insight into how design can be applied to different scales of your life and work. My name is Tinsley Gallion. Um, my, I'll give you a little bit of background on myself. I'm going to kind of set this up by giving a very quick kind of smattering of some of my work just to give you a little context of who I am and what my background is. And then um, look specifically at some design principles that I've kind of tried to articulate and some aspects of the design process that I kind of go through and the kind of problems and issues I come up with when I go through those process. Um, the... Some of you may know um, the virtual fish tank, which is an exhibit at the Museum of Science here. If you have kids, you may have noticed that. It was one of my early projects. This is an image from that. Um, I'm going to let this play for a second and show you a whole series of images here from a number of different projects. Uh, as Nathan alluded to, a lot of my work, certainly in the early years, was these large in installation spaces where you have kind of control over everything. Um, my background is in both computer science as well as design and art. I did my PhD work at the MIT Media Lab in the early 90s. Uh, I was the first PhD student to come out of the Interactive Cinema Group with Gloriana Davenport, and story was a big part of that. So you'll see in, in a number of these examples that, um, uh, that what we're really doing is crafting character and story as part of the experience to engage people. And that process evokes um, an opportunity for them to reflect upon the educational material, which is often embedded in the, in the exhibits themselves. Um, that, was, that right there is a table I actually did with, um, with Dave Small at the MoMA um, just some years ago. And um, the, so my practice kind of evolved from being these large kind of uh, location-based uh, installations to actually moving to things online and on air. And by on air, I mean television, mostly in the kids' space. So we actually had a project where kids could actually create characters in the style of a TV show that Warner Brothers had on the air at the time. And then those characters were entered automatically into a contest. And then those characters were sucked in and actually embedded into the TV show when it broadcast every Saturday morning. So um, you know, a process of, of how do you bring the digital world into the into the broadcast world. Um, so uh, since then, um, a lot of my work has also kind of started to move towards working in the kind of mobile, mobile device space. Um, I'll go into to one project I'm working on in just a moment in, in a little more detail. But um, it, we're at an interesting time kind of in, in history where um, We've got devices proliferating kind of across the planet in a way that that have not have been underutilized. 
right? Uh, it used to be in the past that if we wanted to do something innovative and get it out there and design something, we had the challenge of actually putting out into the marketplace uh, a physical object, right? You have to get it manufactured, you have to ship it, you have to get people to buy it, they have to invest in it, you have to create this infrastructure to be able to do new innovative things on top of or with. And you know, it's now we're at a point in time where the kind of world has already kind of done that, in part because of Apple and others. And you know, I saw a statistic recently that suggested that in 2016, um, one and a half billion smartphones would be sold. Okay, it's units, not dollars. Units, right? And that's within one year, not up to that date, but within that year. So that suggests that one in five people on the planet will buy a new smartphone in that year alone, right? So we've all of a sudden got a new platform to do things on and, and invent and design on that we haven't, haven't ever had before. This is kind of unprecedented. And uh, you know, I would argue that we're maybe using 20% of the potential of that platform at best, right? And so there's an opportunity to very rapidly create something, put it out there, and see how it proliferates and works across a really large base, okay? And how can that change the world? So with that in mind, one of the projects I'm working on right now, and I'll just give a little teaser about this, is there, there happens to be eight, about 800 million illiterate people on the planet today. Um, of that, two-thirds of them are women. 75% um, of them are concentrated in 10 countries, uh, southern, southern Asia and sub-Saharan Africa. And um, you know, this, these are some pictures of some of those folks. Um, UNESCO proposed that if you could bring 170 million of those people into literacy, a very kind of low standard of literacy, the ability to say a couple, write and say a couple sentences about who you are and where you're from, that the follow-on effect would be a 12% reduction in world poverty. Okay, so, you know, I don't know if that's true or not, but... I do know that we're at a point in time in history where the idea of using technology, using mobile devices, this is an example of a, of a girl in one of our test deployments in Ethiopia, uh, using a mobile device has, has the opportunity to actually be brought into a sufficient level of literacy to have it profoundly change her life. Okay? So right now I'm kind of wrapped up in this project <laughs> and looking at how we bring a bring about a designed experience that can be given to kids in this case um, who live in a village with no electricity, right? In one case, 12 kilometers from a water source. No one in the village speaks English. Nobody in the village is literate even in their local language. All, all education in Ethiopia is done in English after grade four. So how can you put in their hands something that they can play and experiment with that can get them to the point where they can fully engage in, an ed in education? Right. So that's, that's one of the things I'm playing with now. Uh, so enough about my background and what I'm working on. Um, Nathan asked me to think um, about design principles, and I chose three here to kind of talk about quickly. Uh, there's, there's many of them over the years that I've kind of cultivated, but I thought these would be most important. I'll, I'll also say that this is that these principles and this process that I'm kind of outlining is informed by kind of two things in the last couple of years. Um, you know, one is that my, my approach to this is very much kind of in the experience design space and often in the user interface space. So it's colored by that. <laughs> um, it's also informed by the fact that over the last couple of years, I've been teaching uh, both at MIT and Tufts a course on, on app design for early education. Okay. And so uh, what, what I've kind of noticed is that as I'm, you know, working with my students, that my students are making particular mistakes and falling into pitfalls that are ones I, I fall into, too, um, and I'm constantly working to stop myself from doing that or creating ways of doing that. So this process is getting, constantly being refined. It'll be refined indefinitely and probably for the rest of my life, but um, it's a snapshot at it. So uh, principle. One is that uh, as I tell my students, um, I've been doing this a long time, and I'm really good at it, and I can't do it right all the time. I have to fail, and I have to embrace that, and I have to do it quickly, right? So I have to try something, see if it's going to work, test it, iterate on that, okay? So embrace that sense of failure, that sense of, of trying. Uh, the other one that I talk about 
uh, and this is often the case with clients, is that if I've done, done my job well, you'll feel like I have done nothing at all. That it's so simple and so clean that you can't imagine it working any other way. So you kind of have to let your ego go and know that when you get there, it's, it's something that everybody completely buys into without I even have to think about it. And, and it's hard for them to remember that you just pulled your hair out for six months to get there. Okay. Um, and part of that process is often uh, about simplifying. Uh, I, I personally find it very easy to generate lots of ideas and you get very attached to those ideas and you want those ideas in your process, but you really need a way to filter that out and simplify it, keep things very clean. Okay, so it's usually good design inevitably turns at some point for me very rapidly from coming up with ideas to being smart about what you leave out, not what you put in. Um, a number of my clients I end up getting involved in kind of really at the branding level with the company. Uh, I think, and that's really because in today's day and age for many different, for many companies, your brand really is the experience that your users or customers are having, right? An example I like to use of that is Google. Nobody gives a crap about what, whether Google changes their logo and they do it to us every day, right? So that's not branding anymore. But if they move the little search button a little bit to one side, we all go nuts, right? So the, their, the experience of that company and them as a brand is really embedded in the user interface that you're giving them, right? And I think you can, you know, all of you can think of examples of that with Facebook or Amazon or any of the other companies that when they, Skype is horrible. They change their friggin' interface every time they put out a new version and you're always searching for how to do things, right? <laughs> right, it's horrible. Um, <laughs> So, you know, so that, that kind of, ex and, you know, Apple is another example of that, that kind of experience design, that kind of what is this con consumer experience is, has become your brand, right? Even more importantly than the traditional branding techniques. Okay, so as you go through the design process, what, what are the kind of things that happen to you that are problematic? Um, one is that by nature, as humans, we find it much easier to think about things as yes or no, A or B, you know, bad or good. We tend to polarize things, right? And so it's very easy for us to want to push things to the extremes. You, you, you put flags in the pitch and talked about the two extremes and the realization that often the right answer is in the middle. But our brains don't like to go to the middle. They like to go to the ends, okay? So how do we, how do we kind of overcome that? Um, we become attached to our ideas. Right, that as we start to kind of brainstorm and get into this and become very familiar with the problem or, the, or what we're trying to work on, we become very attached to a particular solution. And it's easy for us to lose sight of the customer or the user or even our, or even our initial goals. And as a result, as we put those blinders on of attachment to a particular idea, we miss opportunity too. So how do we, how do we balance that need to focus to drill in on something and bring it to some completion while not you know, missing those other opportunities. And I alluded to this already, but we often, we often, in that context, start to forget about who the user is and what point of view they're from. You know, how can we take ourselves out of our thinking and put ourselves back into the head of the person who's going to use what we're designing? So here's a, here's a quick kind of diagram, which I'll walk you through, of the way I think about this kind of early stage of the design process, okay? So, and this is something I've been taking my students through in the, in the, in the last year or two, which is, first of all, I, f I force them to write a goal. And what they almost always come back with is this big paragraph, right? And I'll make them read it to me, and I'll say, so you really mean this? And I'll give them something that's a half a sentence long. And they'll say, yeah, I guess so, right? And so that forcing them to kind of refine it and hone it and say, this is my goal, and maybe a couple sub bullets or two, there are sub goals, but what is that tight goal? And that's, it ends up being only, usually typically only a sentence long, and very difficult to craft, and you spend a lot of time iterating on it, okay? Um, the value in that is it gives you something, it gives you a marker to come back to, something to remember as you start to get lost in your own thinking about what you're designing. It gives you something to check back on. 
Uh, this other practice called a takeaway message is something that came out of early um, museum exhibit design, actually. And it's something I found very useful years and years ago, and I continue to use, which is um, a takeaway message is a message written in the voice of your user. Okay? So you step back and you say, if I went to somebody who had the experience of going through the exhibit I just designed or worked with the app I just created, if I, if I asked them to reflect upon their experience, what would I most want to hear them say back to me? Right? In their words, in their language. Okay, so it does a couple things. You know, one, it, it, it's another way of kind of articulating the goal, but in the language of the user, right? It's also, it's also forcing me to think in their head, not in my head, right? And, um, you know, and think about what their kind of language would actually be, writing in there. Um, sometimes I then take that a step further and actually do a walkthrough. And when I do a walk, when I write a walkthrough of what the experience is going to be like, I actually write, it's one of the only times I write in second person. So um, then there's then there's some level of brainstorming, and out of that comes the articulation of a particular concept. Um, then there's looking at that concept and measuring it against the goals and the takeaway message. Is this concept going to meet the goals that I that I outlined before, right? Keep looking at that. You know, is there something I'm putting into this that's really cool and really fun, but it has no bearing on the goal, right? Um, does it is that experience going to plant in the head of my user the takeaway message that I want to hear back, right? Because that's really what you're trying to do is create an experience where that where that user's thoughts are going to reiterate and give you what you want to hear, right? Um, then this is the part my my uh, my students actually hated this semester, which is that I got them all the way through this process, and they gave me a concept pitch, and I turned to them and said, "You need to throw it out now. You have a week to do a new one." They just had a month to do the first one. They totally freaked out, right? <laughs> and it was great, right? <laughs> because it and it wasn't that I'm saying throw it out, never look at it. It's again, I said you've memorialized it, you've captured it well, put it aside come up with a radically different approach for me, right? Think about something very different, right? And usually what happens after that is that, you know, I had some, some, some groups of students who had done, actually done a very nice job and had something they probably really could run with. It's something that they really stunk. And, you know, what kind of happened was is for the ones that kind of stunk, they said, wow, we found something new that we're really excited about, right? And that process of letting go was really important because they weren't seeing it for being so attached to their first concept, right? And for the people who had a good idea, they freed themselves up and came up with two or three things that totally refined their first, their first concept, right? So once you've once gone through that process, it also gives you an opportunity to explore very different places on that pitch of those two extremes that Nathan referred to. And then we're in a day and age where we can prototype things quickly, whether it's through 3D printing or uh, rapidly putting together something on a handheld device or something else, so we just do it. You do it because you don't know until you've tried it. Right? So you mock something up and you test it. And then, you know, if you're lucky, you iterate on that and refine it. If not, you go back to the concept process. <laughs> right? So um, that's a quick, quick kind of brain dump. So th thank you, and I'll uh, pass it on to the next speaker so that we can I'd like to hear from hope we have time to hear from you guys. Good morning. Thank you, Nathan, for the invitation, and to the dean and everyone for having me here today. I don't miss the irony of being asked to give a monologue about conversation, <laughs> but such as it is, I hope so. And of course, we can make it much more. I can't see my slides here. Just a moment. It would really help if I could see everything. Design is conversation shouldn't be a surprise. And the history of design is littered with conversations, as Nathan beautifully said this morning, and as these very specific examples also exhibit. And I think we all have immediate intuitions about the role of conversation as we design something. Nathan's definition of intentional change to create new choices 
This is a dialogue, a conversation about what may be possible and about what we might make. These examples from design and business, I think, speak for themselves. Look at the business names. And if you doubt it in any way, you can look at the bottom line, which everyone knows, as our Dean Emery today said as well. But my interest, one might call it my particular obsession, is how can we be more formal about these things? How can we be specific? How can we get rigorous? Instead of waving our hands and saying, well, of course, design is conversation. How can we go deeper and get better at it? And what would that practice be? So to go there and to talk about origins, we can go all the way back to the art of steering, which of course is getting where we want to go, getting towards some goal. Tinsley spoke eloquently about goals, and that will come back over and over again. So we act, we correct, and we iterate. And if we're good at what we're doing, and if circumstances don't block us, we can get there. And one might call this the art of steering. There are many examples of this. Here's a circular model of the same thing. And one can say that we're detecting an error, we're correcting the error, and we're feeding back. Again, iterate, fail often. Same message, different diagram. Another way to think about it is that we're sensing and comparing and acting. And this is the foundational mode. The nervous system does this for us. Medicine is all about this. Hello. TQM, been around a long time. It's the same thing. The scientific method is this. Hello. Mobile devices extend our nervous systems and allow us to do this. It's all the same process. It's all the same model. And indeed, design is precisely this. So the idea of design is conversation. Makes sense. The idea of getting what we want and having goals in a system makes sense. Where can we get more specific? How can we go somewhere to a discipline or to a predecessor way of thinking such that we might do it better? And the word is, hello, don't be scared. Cybernetics, you're all familiar with this word. And indeed, Nathan invoked this guy, Norbert Wiener, who wrote the book about cybernetics from 19, late 1940s, 48 was his book. This is not about cyborgs. It's not about artificial intelligence. This is not about cyberspace, cyberpunk, etc. This is about the circle. It's about having a goal, sensing whether we're getting close to the goal, acting to get closer, and on and on. This was his book with the famous subtitle, Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. Boy, that was really bad branding. <laughs> been widely misunderstood. This word control has been, it turns him into a crypto-Nazi, not true. When you hear control, don't think absolute control. Yes, I can always get what I want, but think I'm trying to get what I want. I'm trying to regulate something. It's a softer word. And it's not about cyborgs or the merging of animal and machine. It's just any system that has a goal. This is the science of cybernetics. It's the science of systems that have goals. But he wasn't the only one thinking about it, and he wasn't the only one writing about it. This is a single proceedings of a whole series of meetings funded by the Macy Foundation, little known except within our world. Margaret Mead, hello. What's Margaret Mead doing in the middle of something about cybernetics? Famous anthropologist, blew open the field of anthropology in various ways, was married to Margaret Mead. And here are the participants in the Macy meetings that define cybernetics from the 40s. Psychiatrists, psychologists, philosophers, neurophysiologists, mathematicians, information theorists, all of these people were thinking about systems that had purpose. And that alone defines the scope of this field called cybernetics. But wait a minute. How does a linguist and a philosopher and an anthropologist think about these things? Well, they don't think about code and computers and all of that sort of stuff. They think in linguistic ways. They think about language and agreement. So even in those days, in the 40s, cybernetics was also about this second order way of thinking about things. Not just observing what's going, excuse me, 
not just looking at what's happening here, so I'm, I'm looking at this system, but rather we are observing ourselves observing ourselves. And this is called second order cybernetics. So this is a little Cook's tour, a little background. Then this guy walks in the room, so to speak, Gordon Pask, P-A-S-K, was hired by Negroponte to work in what became the Media Lab when it was called the Architecture Machine Group. And he was writing books like this, a cybernetic theory and methodology of conversation, cognition, and learning. I don't, I don't think I have to say any more, right? He is trying to codify in scientific terms what it means to have a conversation. This is one of his beautiful renderings. This is in one of Negroponte's books. His theory of interaction and models of interaction can be me and you. Uh, sorry, with a separation between us, not talking with, with each other. It can be us in a conversation about goals and methods to achieve those goals. So when you get into a taxi, you say, hi, this is my goal. I want to go to Northeastern. And he drives however the hell he wants. And that's why I was late. Because I didn't specify the means, I only specified the goal. But most of the time in design, you're saying, what is our goal? Where do we want to go? What are we trying to do here? What change do we want to make to make an improvement? And so this was his architecture and his way of thinking about conversation and participants. Well, what do you do with it? Well, a variety of things over a variety of, of years. But let's first quickly ask what it might be. There's a context and a language chosen by a participant and an action begins this exchange. And it usually evokes a reaction and that reaction can be one of many things. But ultimately, if the goals align sufficiently, then the other participant will engage and you'll have this back and forth. And you may reach agreement the agreement may mean a transaction as in a contractual way or simply coordinated action. And this might be in a social network. It might be in a community of action or practice or collaboration for business or a collaboration for design. And this is what Nathan has asked me to talk about. But if we think about it in this way and if we break it into these pieces, what are the pieces? Well, in this framework, there's a context in which we come together. There's a language in which I start. There's a set of exchanges in which that language can evolve. And we might agree on something. We might agree to disagree. We might agree to go have pizza together. We might agree to try to change the world together. All of these things are within the realm of conversation. And so taking PASC and conversation theory and trying to distill it down, one can talk about this cute acronym, CLEAT. So these components of every effective conversation now become a way of saying to students of interaction design, you really want to have a conversation in that social network that you're defining? How do you set the context? Do you? Are you exposing a shared language or are you preventing people from creating a shared language? What's the exchange like? Is it rich and interactive in real time or is it really kind of static and you have to wait and so on? So by breaking conversation into these pieces from a theory, you begin to have some prescriptive tools. Well, what do we do with this? There have been many projects I've done over the years about this, using it as a very, very specific model for design, design as conversation. And I want to start with a simple one and then scare you later. If we're in a group, let's say a business group, and we pull together some people and want to do a project, we have a first conversation. So these little figures that look like E's are people. So they're participants in the conversation. Now, the temptation in business is to say, okay, great, we're the team. So every Monday, 10 o'clock, let's meet, let's see how we're doing, we'll track progress, it's gonna be great, we're gonna do a wonderful job. But if you think about it from a conversation point of view, the purpose of every conversation should be to learn something, to build something new, to go somewhere. And the building of that knowledge has an implication for what we're gonna try to do next. But then that begs the question, who should be in the next conversation? Well, we're the team, we should be there. Well, yeah, but what about Mary and Joe? Do we want to invite them? Who do we want to add and who do we want to, politically charged, 
question, who do we want to subtract? Who do we no longer need as participants in that conversation? There's a technical term in cybernetics called variety, which is like diversity, which is the word we use uh, to mean a broader political thing. Who do we need in this conversation to answer the questions we're going to have next? And what knowledge do we want to bring to that next conversation in order to achieve our next goal? So you could think of the general idea here is instead of designing the team, design the cadence of conversations. Think explicitly about it. Now, you do this a lot. We all do it a lot. But we don't do it formally. And we tend to get stuck in the same people in the same room for the same meeting every time. So if you think about conversation explicitly, and you think about it as a way of evolving ideas and insight and collaboration, then you might use this model, which I used in an engagement with an agency, when they were worried about they had to have 20 people in the room all the time, and it was just too many people. So how do you fix it? This is one way to fix it. It also implies a different reward structure, but I, I don't have time to talk about that today. So that's one example where this becomes a template for a way of operating. Another very quick example, the project I did it when I was at Sun, where it seemed like it was getting stagnant and it seemed like everything that had been go going before was the way we were going in the future. And another insight that comes from conversation theory is an organization is its capacity to have conversations. Who speaks to whom about what is the absolute core thing. And by language, I mean ideas, beliefs, vocabularies, concepts, history. All of this is part of its language. So when you hear language, think of it in a broad way. So the better we get at making iPod 1, the narrower our language becomes because it becomes perfected to do what iPod 1 is supposed to do for us. So it's very hard to make something that's not an iPod. We get good at iPod 2 because it's within the same context. But while it increases efficiency, it increases ignorance because the language gets better and better at doing something narrower and narrower. So the existing language you have that operates effectively for the current business, which is about the past, limits the future business. And to way to, the way to go to future business, the way to innovate, et cetera, is to invent new language, because new language increases opportunity. So one theory of innovation is just invent new language. It's hard, right? But at least you have an insight, and at least you have a way forward. It's not just other things. So forgive me, I'm, I'm running over time. But I want to very quickly show you another place to go. We know, we've heard of design thinking. We know about it. It's IDEO and an uh, extraordinary set of uh, people who for many years have been doing product design. And, and these are the essential elements that I'm sure you're familiar with. And it's all about iteration and evaluation. My question is, what are its limits? Because I always want to know the limits of something. It's a bit like Tinsley saying, you know, what are the failures and how do we know how to get better? So I'm always asking questions. Really? Does it really do what you say it does? So if we were to rethink this, maybe we could think of designing the conversations in the sense that I've given you. To find a focusing problem is to say, we're not going to boil the ocean of all possible situations that we can think of. We're going to think of this one. But that one has to fit with the new economy, bits to atoms. And it has to be consistent with our DNA. And of course, prototyping that we've heard a lot about. And iterating and evaluating is always important. We, we need to measure improvements. We need to know how we're getting better. And we need to know when we're converging. We need to know when we're getting toward that port. So I would say that everything I just said is a, a conversation to agree on. How are we going to do what we're going to do? Conversation to agree on means. But, but wait a minute. What are the goals? And how do we agree on the goals? But if creating new language is the requirement for creating innovation, then we have to have that conversation. And of course, everything I just said is the conversation of conversations. So it's not as elaborated as it seems. It's just very conscious and very explicit about what we're trying to do. And this is how I think about design as conversation. Thank you very much. I guess uh, what I would like to do is really open it to the floor. We've had each of us some time to speak, and I think uh, uh, there were many provocative things said, and there are threads across this, of course, that were 
pointed out. But I'd really like to hear from uh, people in the room. Um, and if you have questions or comments uh, of our panelists, uh, we have a mic for you as well. And Tony, if you identify yourself, Tony Deritis. I'm, I'm Tony Deritis. I'm chair of the music department at Northeastern, and I'm jointly appointed in the entrepreneurship and innovation group in Northeastern University. Um, my first question is for Jenna, and also, also for Timothy. Is it Tinsley? Tinsley, excuse me. Um, and this is the role of computer science and coding in doing what you do. And uh, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about whether or not, with English and math. Coding should now be a core skill that all freshmen or, if not suitor, students, have to take in order to move forward. Um, okay, great. It's working. Um, I, I think that's actually kind of a complicated question. So while I do think of myself as a professional designer, I sort of think of myself as a journeyman coder. Like, it's my tool. And I'm pretty good at using it, but I don't actually have a great academic background in sort of the beauty and design and theory behind it. And while I'm interested in those topics, they're not actually core to what I do. So while I think that um, in the same way that people once learned typing, everyone needs to learn sort of the, the base ideas of computer science, you know, in elementary school, um, I think choosing to understand it in a deep way and engage with it um, from a theoretical perspective, might still be a choice in the same way that, you know, higher math is a choice. Um, and I think that choosing to do or not do that is actually going to maybe be the big differentiator in the future uh, among people because everyone will need to understand some of the base systematized thinking behind computer science, but only a subset of people will actually understand it and push it forward. So I, I would echo that very much tool. Um, you know, I went through and got degrees both in the fine arts and in computer science at a time when those weren't blended and it took me twice as long. Um, it, um, <laughs> the, um, you know, it has some value because I'm very deep in both, um, but I paid a big price to get there. Um, there, there's certainly a level of understanding you can get by, you know, learning how to use the tools and learning how to code at a level where you don't have to be a full-fledged system architect in computer science. Um, it is very valuable, uh, much like you wouldn't, you know, almost anybody that's working in the design field today or even outside the design field has to have a certain level of skills with, you know, Adobe products, for example. Um, there's, there's another side to that, which is, um, from the educational perspective, is, you know, when I started at the MIT Media Lab, uh, one of my professors, Seymour Papert, I was there. Uh, a colleague of mine as a student was Mitch Resnick. And they were very much of the mindset that the process of learning to code is an essential part of learning to unlock a certain way of thinking. That it's learning to think about thinking. Right, and so that the value of learning to code was was not just the skill that you get from it, but the ability to enhance your cognitive understanding of thinking about thinking. The danger is that we confuse the logic of computers to be all possible kinds of human logic, and that just ain't so. I don't need to say that even. And the generalization of Papert and others at the time. Cognition, I think, was a stretch. It was a stretch that AI likes us. And I just would want to constantly point out to anyone of any age that the logic of machines is not the logic of biology, nor the logic of thinking and feeling as people. Yeah, I, would, I would follow on that caution about, about computers as they exist as part of this uh, binary digital project, that these two-state model doesn't really get close to anything that's going on in the connectome, the neurology, neurology of, our, of our brains. And I think uh, fuzzy logic, which was for some reason unpopular because of bad branding uh, in the US, uh, was taken up in other parts of the world with great success because it, it, it deals with ambiguity. It deals with this uh, between state, the maybe state, the consider, consideration space. Um, the internet, for example, is kind of binary in that sense. It's either private or public. 
So your privacy is at risk because you, you want to negotiate a transaction. Um, so uh, when Lawrence Lessig was arguing before the Supreme Court around privacy issues, my comment to him was, think about uh, the house, the street, the porch, and the curb. Yard sale happens in the yard. By the end of the day, you put it on the curb. It's pretty much yours. If you move it to the porch, you're in this middle space. It's semi-private space. It's semi-public space. And you go inside the house, it becomes even more intimate, depending on which room you go to. Um, I was in Maine recently, and there they have these farm stands where everything's based on trust. So there's this quasi-public private space where the farm stand is, and there's a can there for money and some vegetables, and you can pick them up and leave your money. That's been a tradition for years. The sign I saw, hand-painted sign by the road, said, thieves struck produce on porch. So it moved it to the semi-private space from the curb, uh, but gives you a sense of this, the need for consideration space in these transactions that we're involved in, uh, in cyberspace, which is really a part of this binary project. You're in or you're out, you're with us, you're not. And, that's, and Fuzzy Logic addresses that. And the threads on Fuzzy Logic now at Berkeley are starting to talk more uh, about uh, natural language processing. And there was a very interesting exchange, a couple of email messages between uh, Latvizade, the inventor of Fuzzy Logic, and Noam Chomsky this summer. Both of them are very busy people, but if you were on that thread, you caught two UFOs crossing, and those two guys had an exchange around linguistics, natural language processing, and Fuzzy Logic. So there's hope because we could break out of this binary model and have really amazing things happen. And just real quick, longer in the dark ages of computing because design has risen so much. So if we make all of the designers, coders, mm, about that. Thanks very much. Um, so I come out of the University of California, Berkeley, and their Center for New Music and Audio Technologies, which is related to, um, you know, basically my mentor is a, is a mathematician slash cognitive psychologist. Uh, the other kind of influence on this idea of human-computer interaction or natural language, uh, artificial intelligence, is, is the kind of the role of Wittgenstein and the idea of bringing disciplines side by side and creating languages. So I was wondering if you could, is, is Wittgenstein any part of your world when you start thinking about constructing languages in order to stimulate innovation? Uh, not for me explicitly, but Heinz von Forster, who was meetings that I showed you, uh, he was in and out. Am I doing something? A different mic? Is it coming in and out now? Can you hear me now? Um, so Wittgenstein's behind it in the sense of uh, has influenced cybernetics a great deal. And the idea that language is a construct that we're constantly evolving is core to second order cybernetics. And it's core to every conversation we have. One could say that we in this room now have a new language, which only we share based on what we've heard today. And of course, it has to be founded in our common context and the shared language of English that we start from, but it evolves from here. So it's very consistent with all of that. Other comments, questions? Tony? Hi, this is, uh, this is for, for Jenna. Um, one of the things that really resonated with me was the model that you created, and then you went from that model and you then took it into the real world. So this idea of going from theory into practice, perhaps. Can you tell me wh what are some of the things that really are great about that, but also some of the things that are not so great about that. Because when you go from that theory to the practice, does anything not work out? Or yeah, yeah I mean that's um, that's the challenge. So I'm a planner. I really like to think through what I'd like to do before I do it. I kind of in that whole cycle of when do you start the cycle of design? I'm my I'm way way back. Um, and using, using digital tools and also coming from a background where I do kind of have a slightly computer science way of thinking about um, systemization. Um, that's really, it's really helpful for me to have a bunch of those iterations first virtually um, where you can really change things very rapidly. Um, but then there's this sort of transitional period, which is actually generally the hardest period, where you need to refine your simulation to be good enough to actually make. 
Um, and so that's actually where I get really excited because the first time you try to make something from a digital model in a certain way, you're going to fail. You're going to miss tolerances. You're going to not understand the manufacturing technique well enough. You're basically going to misunderstand your tool, the tools that you're using. And so sort of iterating on that um, and making making small versions, making ver versions of the project um, in, in other mediums until you have enough confidence to, you know, send out the order to the giant CNC machine is, is really, really important, I think. Um, so uh, where, where this can fall down is, of course, if you end up sort of spending all of your time thinking about your tooling and that process, um, maybe radical changes towards the very end of the process are no longer as possible as they, they were in the beginning. So it's a trade-off of where you want your flexibility. Um, but one of the things that I think is really advantageous is that then you have one system sort of that's controlling uh, the whole thing. So if, you, if you're working in different mediums, whether it be mixed digital and physical or different kinds of physical, you really need to think about all of the pieces and how they work together before you execute. Um, and I think that, that for me personally, that's a great advantage because it, it forces you to think as all of the actors in the, in the process. Thank you. Um, what Jenna says brings up, a, I think, also this issue of tools for making tools, so the mutable tool. And I was, I was wondering how, to what extent the conversation between the hand and the tool, say in manual tools, uh, what's going on between steering um, and, and, and may I change my behavior to make this microphone work? How I work with a tool to make it a better tool means I have to arrange my life in a different way. I have to behave in a different way, and I create a different experience for everyone. Suddenly my voice is gone. <laughs> the relationship with the, the hand to the tool, I started like... Let me... And the microphone to the point where it became obvious that it wasn't the best means for expressing myself. I it in a lot of the MIT experience through... through this idea of making the tool to make a tool, uh, and then tools to make tools to make tools, and tools that can be shared amongst people who have an influence on the tool itself in the making, uh, is sort of embedded in all this. And I think this I think the circle still applies uh, in, the, in maybe the conversational sense, and the language is more physical and sure. biological. There, it's always a circle. There are some interesting projects that kind of hone right in on what you're talking about at, at the Media Lab right now. So On um, took you know a Dremel tool that was being used to carve a sculpture, um, and equipped it with a set of to where it was, so you could follow. It, you would have a three D model of what you wanted to sculpt, and then it would steer you and tell you when you're going too deep or too or high to keep you along the trajectory. But you had the choice as you went as to whether to abide by that or not, and also how you textured the surface. So it was an interesting end of being able to. Right, that line. Yeah, it's the story of the, the Pieta, which is this fabulous sculpture in marble, as, you know, at scale uh, in the Vatican, uh, which Michelangelo produced and, and used a tool, invented a tool to make that. So he, he took a can and put oil in it. So he made this small model of the sculpture, put it in a can, filled it with oil, and then let the oil or water out, and then saw the contour that was revealed at that moment carved that into the block. So he was actually kind of a reverse of 3D printing. It was the everything you take away makes, you know, take a piece of wood and cut away everything that's not a guitar and you have a guitar. So he was really doing that with the Pieta and the block of marble. But it was the idea of using a tool to do that. And much of what people attribute to sort of the ingenuity of artists working on direct representation of things that they're thinking of is, is mediated by tools. Uh, as people invent th things like perspective as a tool to render the image that they wish to render, and so forth and so on. So there's, there's tool making across history in the, in the design and art of making things as well. Uh, Tinsley, I have a question for you. So I'm really curious about the mobile devices and designing the experience through mobile devices. So can you maybe talk a little bit more about that 
from a marketing perspective, I'm a marketing innovation person, but from a marketing perspective, a lot of companies are now doing research via mobile devices. And so are you using the mobile devices to learn about the experience so that then you can create something on that mobile device? Absolutely, absolutely. It's one of the beauties of that platform is you can kind of iterate on it. Um, you know, the project I kind of outlined for you, uh, the Global Literacy Project, is actually an extreme of that. Um, my involvement in that project is less about designing exactly what the experience is for the kids, but actually designing a, a platform upon which many people can contribute, and the data we get about how they're using it informs us as well. So actually, in that, it's, it's an extreme example. We're, we're actually, with these, we have about 500 tablets in the field now in South Africa, Ethiopia, and And um, they're on every day they're streaming back data to us about how the kids are utilizing the tablets and intermittently with assessments on how they're, how they're uh, improving in their skills. And that is in a tight feedback loop to suggest whether the content they're actually spending time with is actually moving um, and, and on a long learning trajectory. So it, it's a combination of, of a large data problem as well experience problem. I think you're seeing there's lots of great tools kind of coming on the market for people who are developing and deploying apps as products. And, um, there was a recent one I just saw where um, I think they're out of the UK. Okay, it's just, on, just coming out. And you, you put this on the device and when you hand it to somebody, it actually takes a video stream of everything they do on the device. It shows you where all the touches are. You get that back to you logs that in a way that you can review it. And at the same time, uh, it can also just take video out of the front camera. So all of a sudden, from a remote perspective, you can get this wealth of information about how you can see what you the product. I, I have a question for you. It's This one's working. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and I think it kind of pulls together the discussion you've been having about tools um, and and conversation and the early because when I was listening to your whole presentation and conversation, I was um, sort of flashing in and out of situations and environments in which I have been conscious of experiencing something like that or using something like that without ever saying oh, cybernetics <laughs> while I was in, in the moment. Um, but you know, one of the things about this conference is we have people from a lot of different dif disciplines and industries, um, and so we're listening with great fascination to something that's a, a shared dialogue among you, and um, you've used some similar tools to, uh, to express yourself. And um, designers, of course, have a, a, a particular, I think, understanding and appreciation and almost love of tools, but in other disciplines, we have tools too. And so I wanted to give you an example um, and, and um, see if you had another one like it that is cross-disciplinary. So um, um, my, my original education was back in the 60s at Rhode Island School of Design and then several decades later I became a lawyer. Um, and at one point I was called back to my alma mater uh, to the ID department as it turns out because they had been asked to uh, sign a contract agreement um, and it was at the beginning of a project, and it uh, the gist of the contract that they'd been asked to sign was very aggressively um, taking the view that, well, we're going to do something, there's going to be some valuable idea, and, and we want to own it, and we're, we're going to apply for a patent on it, and it's going to be, we, we have to have it, we want to own it, and, you know, very mine, not yours, et cetera. And so the um, professors who'd been handed this um, were kind of uncomfortable with it but not sure they understood it and so they asked me to come down and talk to them so at the end of the day I get in the car and I drive down to Providence I walk into a, a room in the in um, the ID department and they're ready for me and what they had done was they had taken the contract which was rather short um, blown it up printed it out and cut phrases out and laid out on the table, they had words and they had phrases, and they're using a different tool, right? 
and wanted to use that as a way of understanding but also redesigning the contract, right? So, um, which was fascinating to me. I, I won't say it was necessarily effective entirely, but I think they were drawn into the process much more than they would have been without it. Um, it might probably time um, and efficiency because um, they were bringing to it. So a couple of you have touched on this. You know, the preciousness of what you bring to something, you get to something, you, you think you've got it, and that makes you not see other things. So their familiarity with moving around um, what were two-dimensional um, bits um, and arranging them, as a designer might, um, was a, a bit of a distraction from what the meaning was and that it wasn't already, well, you say. I, you, can, you can continue what I'm going to say. What would you expect? What I was expecting was that you couldn't put it all back together because the pieces were not the essence. The pieces were components in, in a set of coherences or a set of ideas. Concept maps, which Hugh Doverly, our colleague that Nathan mentioned, has, Hugh has pioneered the use of concept maps, is all about the systemic coherence of individual concepts or ideas and how they interrelate semantically. And that would have been what might have been useful to construct rather than take it to bits and reduce it to put it back together. It also strikes me that uh, they lost the they lost the opportunity to arrive at the shared goal. So by focusing on the language of the how this will be accomplished, they, everyone in the room is losing sight of coming to a shared goal. So that's the conversation that probably didn't happen, was the one less looking at it. What is our goal here? Are we educating young designers? Are we creating uh, cultural capital? Are we creating things of economic value? I think this is all about intellectual property. And I think maybe by moving the you know, by having separate or even conflicting goals, the language could never express the agreement that was probably lacking. You're moving around the deck chairs. Well, um, you know, you, you touched on, you know, something that's that's key to, to helping people, in fact, um, reach agreement and carry out their transactions is that, you know, don't, don't put any documents on the table. First figure out what the transaction is and what you want to do, and you lose so much time. It becomes so inefficient and often... Um, damning if there's a document to look at too soon. Okay, um, we have to take a break, but certainly feel free to talk to our panelists. So we'll take a 15 minute break and thank you to all the panelists.